Hi, everyone. Um, that's a pretty cool experience to see your game on a big screen like that. Um, my name is Nikita Danshin. I am, a, well, the thing said, a co-founder, developer, and a composer on the team of Egnat. Uh, we are a 12 people in this studio based across five different countries working remotely on that, our first title, Megbone. So this is a noir role-playing adventure about a raccoon detective in dystopian Vancouver, BC, Canada. It's an immersive mix of high-quality pixel art, as you might see, and graphic tech commonly, commonly not used with pixel art, like dynamic lighting, PBR materials, normal maps, decals, and all is built in Unreal Engine 4. So this talk is presented by me uh, and Radu Jirjoba, our tech artist. It was prepped with the help of Tamara Klipinina, our uh, lead environment artist. She was supposed to talk uh, in, instead of me, but I'm uh, covering for her as she was not able to present here today. So this talk consists of two parts. Uh, one where we discuss our art techniques and one where we look at them deeper from tech standpoint. So, in this first part, let's talk about lighting um, in general and how we mix 2D art with 3D environment. Lighting is arguably the most important aspect of art. In the dawn of digital era, artists used to draw lighting straight on the textures of sprites as there was no engines capable of calculating the realistic behavior of light. As an example of that, we have old school sprite games like Heroes of Mighty Magic, Mighty Magic, somebody definitely likes that, uh, Castlevania, and Syndicate. Uh, with evolving technologies and higher processing power, new real uh, time lighting capabilities were developed, such as dynamic lights, shadows, normal maps. Light became more realistic, taking on properties from the actual laws of physics. Uh, these examples are from Blade of Darkness, with Dynamic Shadows, Silent Hill 2, I believe, Thief, and Doom 3. As time progressed further, even new lighting tech raised the fidelity higher than ever. Uh, for example, Crisis 1, using screen space ambient occlusion, Fear, using ray-marched volumetric lighting, Uncharted 4, with reflective shadow maps for global illumination, and recently released Control, uh, with ray tracing. However, all techniques are still valid today. Even with an abundance of new tools, artists choose to create lighted textures, some to follow nostalgic aesthetics, some because of technical limitations of their engines, and some just think it looks great. These examples are from Stardew Valley, Moonlighter, Guilty Gear, and Hyperlight Drifter. You might know about those. So we think that pixel art aesthetics are great, but they could use a little refreshment. So for our first title, Backbone, we combined pixel art with modern lighting techniques. So figuring out an art style for your game might take some time and a lot of experimentation. For Backbone, we gradually came up with a pipeline that facilitates all our stylistic needs and provides a transparent and effective framework for each <laughs> frame a uh, player will see in the final game. So I'm gonna go through this pipeline using one of the locations from the game as a reference. So the first one, sketch. Sketch, um, our main goal here is to plan out the location, light sources, and their colors. This is the most crucial step uh, that dictates the rest of the work on that scene. Then we draw pixel art assets with that lighting in mind. Uh, we position them on a scene according to the sketch. As you see, everything is located on a 3D plane. Uh, we use the characters for size reference to make sure that everything looks fine. In terms of positioning, there are actually no set rules here at all. We don't use any kind of grid system. We just do whatever looks good. Then we place light sources, uh, play with reflective surfaces like that mirror over there, um, set up coloring of the light, scattering, and many other properties that we'll just dive into later. 
For floors, walls, and ceilings, we use materials uh, with custom normal and roughness maps that react to the light, uh, to the light sources and add more depth to the image. And that would be the final result. Here are a couple of more examples from uh, another level in the game. As you see on the sketch, we set up the lighting, uh, make sure that it comes from the top, from those four bulbs, then we sketch those assets, we position them um, on the scene, set up the lighting, set up the uh, custom materials, for, for example, for those floors at the bottom, and that's how the scene looks like at the final stage. So for Backbone, we draw lights and shadows directly on sprites. In our experience, it helps to convey the color, shape, and form of an object. Remember that visual art is all about fooling the eye into thinking that it's looking at the real object, so pixel art is no different. In this example, um, we drew the red lighting, red lighting specs on the column and wires hanging next to the plant source of a very bright uh, red neon light. So when we turn the lights on, the image comes to life. Uh, these couple of red dots made the engine lighting even more vibrant. Before I would dive deeper into the specifics of lighting, uh, let's go back to the basics. Uh, I want to talk about composition. Generally, each scene can be broken down into different planes. Um, foreground, middle ground, and a background. In Backbone, all important information is concentrated in the middle ground. This is where the player character is located, as well as interactable objects, NPCs, enemies, and so on. Foreground is used to add another layer of information and make the scene seem deeper. In our case, foreground objects are usually located on the sides or upper lower parts of the screen. This way, they just don't block the view of the player character and don't take too much attention from what's happening in the middle. Uh, remember that smart positioning is better immersion for a player, always like that. We also break this rule for different narrative and artistic purposes. In this scene, uh, we deliberately block player's view with objects in the background, um, sorry, foreground. This adds to the atmosphere of an unsettling, cramped up place where a player doesn't know what to expect next. And that's how it looks like. The silhouette of the player character is obscured by foreground objects, creating a feeling of uncertainty. There are also locations where foreground is simplified to silhouettes, like this scene in a busy night bar. Now that I've covered the basics, let's build on the difficulty and introduce multidimensional approach to the composition. Backbone is built by placing 2D sprites in the 3D environment, so we decided to use it to our own advantage. It's difficult to mix 3D and 2D with flat planes as your assets are in multidimensional environment. The visual style like that is sometimes called two and a half D, dimensional. Sprites and meshes in Backbone might be flat, uh, but we position them in a way that makes them look 3D. For example, our movie theater board is made of sprites positioned in a certain, certain angle in 3D environment. 3D objects can help uh, add more volume, make the world seem more vibrant and immersive, but placed next to plain 2D sprites, 3D objects draw players' attention and make everything around them seem even more flat. So in our case, it's important to use them sparingly. In Backbone, you will find 3D objects on larger structures, like parts of buildings, and mostly in the middle ground. If they're positioned in the foreground or background, perspective during movement distorts them, which doesn't really look nice in our opinion. This is the footage from Backbone Kickstarter trailer from 2018. Uh, here we experimented with 3D on smaller objects, uh, the green drawer over there, um, and the table in the front, the sink on the drawer is still to the plane and looks unnatural and distracting position next to a 3D object. 
To solve this, we could have gotten rid of all 3D whatsoever or completely switched to voxel art. We chose to use 3D sparingly and it seems like it's the right direction for us at the moment. Today, backbone rooms are, well, basically cubicles filled with 2D assets. To combat the flatness, we set the camera further away and tightened the field of view. This way, perspective distortion on floors and ceilings does not conflict with overall style. The space between the objects still adds to the feeling of depth, uh, creates parallax effect, and gives space for shadows that the objects create. Here's an example. These identical elongated shapes in, placed in this scene look like cubes with our scene's camera setup. This is why we stretch walls, floors, and ceilings. That way they look proper with our camera settings. Without the stretching, pixelated textures in the walls would create too much visual noise, like the one on the left, and we want all the attention directed at the scene, not the walls. So the result would be the one that we have on the right. Objects located next to the walls, like doors, paintings, are drawn in perspective distortion. This trickery is invisible to player, yet the whole scene would look like wrong if we didn't do that. By keeping the perspective distortion in mind uh, when creating assets, the objects look natural from every player position. Doors are the most encountered example of these. Getting back to the cubes. Notice how perspective distortion affects the cubes differently. While moving through the level, you can see both blue sides on the left cube, but only one blue side is visible on the right one. The position of the player character and camera all affect the object perspective. So here is an example of our perspective. Chair on the left here, there, is drawn in linear perspective, while the one on the right is orthogonal, which is usually used in schematic drawings. We use that in most of our assets. So as Howard walks around, you can see that the table in the foreground is in the orthogonal perspective. The corkboard on the right wall is in linear. So see how the camera moves around and they stay within their patterns. So uh, my last point is layers. Uh, layering is our main instrument for creating more depth and volume in a two and a half dimensional world. Layering 2D sprites in a 3D environment creates depth, so-called Parallax. Parallax is an amazing, effective tool for adding detail and depth to the game world. We use it a lot. As you may see, there are plenty of objects stacked into each other. And we use it with room decorations and backgrounds to make the world seem more alive. But obviously, we can break this rule, again, as we do uh, in our close-up mechanic. That thing allows the player to interact with objects through a drag and drop gameplay, and there's no need for depth, so the visual rules change here. Texture resolution is usually higher, and we just don't use any engine lighting, instead uh, indicating the lighting straight into the textures. So that's the basics of uh, how we deal with perspective, layering, pixel assets, and positioning 2D assets in 3D environment. Now, uh, Radu will talk about how we deal with visuals from the technical standpoint. So uh, I'm Radu Jujoba, and I did the technical art on Backbone. Uh, so while prototyping the style of Backbone, we encountered multiple issues. Some of them were due to the unpredictable nature of uh, combining 2D and 3D. Some were due to technical limitations. But most of the time, uh, we found whatever, uh, some, some stuff we did just didn't look good. And so uh, we'd like to tell you about uh, what worked for us and what didn't. Uh, but just remember, what we did is just uh, 
are just some of the uh, many approaches we could have taken to lighting. So uh, our game doesn't have much geometric detail, so when building our world, a lot of the visual detail needs to be added in through lighting and materials in order to create a convincing atmosphere. Uh, but since most of our objects are 2D, we have come across some uh, challenges lighting our game, namely paper 2D not supporting light maps. Uh, and as it turns out, it's hard lighting a game in three dimensions when most of your objects are uh, just flat planes facing the same direction. Uh, so here I've set up a quick example to illustrate uh, the challenge we had with Paper 2D. Uh, at the top there, there's a static sphere with baked uh, lighting, and so it affects both uh, mesh light maps and volumetric light maps, but it doesn't act as an actual direct light. And so on the left here, we have a static plane mesh, and because it has surface light maps, it gets nicely lit by the sphere, uh, uh, and it's also shadowed near the edges of the cube there. Uh, in the middle, we've got the same plane mesh, but it has a dynamic mobility. So uh, while it doesn't have uh, surface light maps, it still gets affected by the volumetric light maps. Uh, so it's, it's not quite as accurate, but it still is able to be affected by the surrounding static lighting. Uh, and then on the very right here, we have a paper 2D sprite, and so it doesn't have light maps, uh, and it doesn't get affected by volumetric light maps the only lighting it receives is from the skylight and any dynamic direct lights we have in the scene. So to get around this issue, we started using plane meshes for static sprites instead, and this allowed us to start uh, bouncing lighting off uh, sprites, and so we could have them, we could bake light, ma light maps onto them, and then also have them affect and be affected by the volumetric light maps. And so how we do that currently is we just have a tool that places planes into the world, and since our sprites are generally half a texel per centimeter, we can also scale them automatically based on their texture resolution. Uh, but we don't actually use the same plane mesh for all of our sprites, since they all uh, are in square. If we did that, we would start getting stretched light maps due to their different aspect ratios. So what we could do is pad the alpha maps of all our sprites so they would all be perfectly square but then that would start slowing down performance because of overdraw. So instead, we have a few different elongated plane meshes with different light map UVs, and that allows us to have more consistent light maps throughout the game. Uh, the issue now is we still need to use Paper 2D for our sprites so we can uh, support character animations properly. Uh, so if we had them running around this completely baked scene, then they would, they would look out of place if they weren't fully affected by the uh, static lighting around them. So what we did to help mitigate this issue is we, in a, we, implemented, a custom deferred, we implemented some custom deferred lights, and these basically act like stock and real lights for the artists, but they're diffuse only, so they're a lot cheaper to render. And because Paper 2D still uh, writes the G buffer, then they, they can, these lights can help ground our characters into the world without having uh, as much of a uh, per performance impact as unshadowed lights would. Uh, and so because we want them to only contribute diffuse lighting, we want, them to, we want the lighting impact to be more ambient, despite the fact that they are actually just point lights. So we only calculate distance fall off, uh, normal contribution, and in some cases the uh, spotlight, uh, spotlight cone angle. So there's no roughness calculation, uh, Fresnel, uh, specular, shadows, just anything else that would be physically based. So for the distance fall off, we, uh, we noticed inverse squared fall off gives these really bright highlights close to the light source, uh, and then that just rapidly fades off. And we didn't want the lighting to be, we wanted the lighting to be more ambient, and so this doesn't really look very good for the effect we're trying to go for. So instead of inverse squared fall off, we just square the initial distance fall off, and that gives us a nice, really uh, smooth gradient with a more ambient feel. And then, uh, but we, we still have this problem that the uh, contribution of normal still makes it easy to tell where these uh, sort of fake lights are coming from in the scenery. So for the normal contribution, we just, instead of dotting the uh, normals with the light direction, we have an artist-controlled wrap parameter uh, to wrap the lighting around to geometry, not facing, uh, not directly facing the light. Uh, and so in the first half of this video, uh, here you can see 
what it looks like moving that value from zero to one, and it gives some nice uh, smooth lighting. But then if we push that zero past the, uh, past the zero to one range, we can fade that off to just uh, fall off where it's just the pixel distance from the light. And it's essentially, visually, it just looks like the normals aren't even being considered. Uh, and so another problem we had with these is since the lights are unshadowed, they can leak through solid wa uh, walls quite easily. And this specific example is quite extreme, but if we have this uh, spotlight pointing at a wall like this, and we want uh, light bouncing off of that wall, uh, if we just put a point light there, then that's gonna leak through to the other side and cause all sorts of issues. So uh, this is a problem for us because although the game is mostly comprised of uh, 2D sprites, we still have three-dimensional walls separating uh, our interior rooms. So placing these bounce lights right next to the walls would uh, make lighting leak in between those rooms. Uh, so we added a cone angle parameter to the lights as well for cases like this. And for the artist, it's just like using a normal spotlight uh, going from zero to 180 degrees. But in the shader, it's passed in from the negative one to one range. Uh, with negative one being 180 degrees and with uh, one representing zero degrees. And this allows us to give the lights some directionality uh, when it's needed and keeps the lighting from leaking through walls. Uh, so in game, we just use these bounce lights where we've got uh, lights dynamically changing or uh, where uh, we feel the, the lighting, the static lighting, and uh, isn't enough to shadow our, to shade our characters properly. And so in this case, we've just got this uh, flickering light in this dark alley. And so uh, we've just put a, uh, an ambient light right below the floor there. And that does a nice job of uh, lighting up the environment and lighting up our character and bouncing that light back up from the ground. Uh, so touching on volumetric fog just for a second, uh, one, one challenge we had was uh, in our, one of our levels, we have these cars with uh, volumetric uh, fog coming from the headlights moving in the foreground. And so if you look at the, that taxi on the left there, the volumetric fog from the car behind it is clipping through at the very beginning. And they're also leaving this uh, quite jarring uh, ghosting artifact. Uh, so uh, we can't just, and that's, uh, that's a result of the temporal reprojection that volumetric fog uses. And we can't just turn that off because then we get some pretty bad looking volumetric lighting throughout the rest of the level. Uh, so what we ended up doing was we reused the early light code from our custom lights in a two dimensional uh, sprite material. And then we just attached those sprites to the uh, car's headlights. And so then we can just pass in the, the spotlight parameters into the sprite and that ended up giving us a very similar looking result while getting rid of the uh, issue that volumetric fog was causing, and then also saving some performance. Uh, uh, so great, we've got some nice general lighting and the big light maps gives us some pretty good shadows, but then the issue remains that when building lighting, in some areas we still need these either sharp shadows or uh, these shadows with really sharp contact shadows. And unless we start bumping up uh, light map resolution and lighting quality, uh, and then that's not really something achievable with just light maps. Uh, so we decided to implement some simple shadow decals to our game, and this is what the material looks like. Uh, it's very simple, just zero for the base color, one for the roughness, and uh, a parameter for opacity. And the reason specularity is a parameter here is because in some, some of our earlier levels, uh, some of the surfaces used uh, some, uh, the, the, the specularity va values weren't consistent, and so the shadow decals would end up looking either too bright or uh, too dark. And then we also add a small amount of dithering to the opacity to mitigate some banding artifacts we get. Uh, and w while we don't use uh, temporal anti-aliasing for denoising, the effect is subtle enough that we don't actually need it and the, if the final sh decals are still relatively smooth. And so here we've got them just placed around this room uh, on the right there, it's the shadow decal specific to the uh, sprite that's casting the shadow. Uh, and then on the uh, left wall and the, and the ceiling there, we've got some just general uh, linear fall off decals. Uh, here again, we've got some decals on the ceiling to simulate uh, sort of ambient lighting coming in through that window from outside. And so generally, we don't use them too excessively, just 
where we feel some uh, sharp ambient lighting will help or where we need some more accurate shadows without uh, bumping up lighting quality. Uh, and another issue we had was in some scenes the player character felt a little out of place. And so where uh, we've got this really strong directional ambient lighting. And so in this case, there's a lot of uh, ambient lighting coming in from that stage in the background. And so what, what we could have done is set up this uh, low res uh, spotlight to sort of uh, emulate that effect. Uh, but we've already got enough uh, shadow casting lights in this scene as it is, and we don't want to drag down performance even more. So for situations like this, we came up with a special decal that uh, dynamically moves and morphs around the player based on some artist-placed uh, pivot representing the focal point of the ambient light. Uh, and so in this video, you can see that decal in action. Uh, we've got this area light right above the player there, and as the player moves, the decal uh, also changes shape around the player. And then as the light also moves around, the decal is also uh, morphing around the player. So it's not, so we can change these at runtime. They're not just uh, statically placed. Uh, and uh, so now here's that previous scene again. And uh, on the right, you can see what it looks like with the shadow decal. And it really helps ground our character into the world a little more. And so how the actual decal works is we just take a circle and stretch it non-uniformly, and then we can do a uniform blur on it, and then a non-uniform blur in the opposite direction of which is being stretched, and then we can pack that uh, eight frames of that into the flipbook on the right there. And so as it gets stretched, the uniform blur is decreased, and the non-uniform blur is increased, and that gives the illusion of a larger penumbra coming from the top portion of the character. And so the actual uh, texture was made in Substance Designer. So in Engine, for the material, we just interpolate between the two nearest frames based on uh, the character's distance from uh, this artist placed light pivot. Uh, something else we did some testing with is dynamically blurring shadow decals uh, at runtime, so we wouldn't have to make these pre-blurred uh, textures for a lot of individual sprites. Uh, on the left here, we have this pixel art sprite that we would use in our game. And on the right, there's just some uh, random texture with an alpha, uh, with an alpha map. And so you can see at the, as the shadows base, we get these really nice uh, contact shadows, these really nice sharp shadows. Then as we get further away, they get blurry and blurrier. Uh, and the way these decals work is they would just be a mesh decal in the form of a plane. Uh, just placed on the ground or any flat surface. And then with a vertex shader, we could individually move the left, right, uh, and top edges of that. Uh, and then the decal could be blurred with a parameter uh, specified by the artist. And then we, could just, we just mask that off with the texture coordinates so we get that nice contact hardening effect. And the way the blur works is similar to what Playdead did for their frosted glass. But essentially, we just sample equal areas uh, up to eight times within a radius around each pixel. And then we jitter that sample uh, position each frame so, there's re so the result can be cleaned up by TAA. Uh, but our game, we, we want to keep this pixel perfect uh, look in our game, meaning we, don't, we can't actually use TAA. And so we ended up not using this specific type of decal. Uh, we just thought it was uh, worth mentioning. Uh, so going back to our general sprite lighting, uh, even with baked lighting and lots of lights placed throughout the environment, the, the scene can still look pretty flat in a lot of cases. Uh, looking at this scene with the lighting preview, the, the metal ground objects look like uh, just flat cards, which they are, but we still need these objects to look and uh, feel like objects grounded in the world. And then additionally on top of that, it's uh, their silhouettes sort of blend in together, and it's really hard to make out their individual shapes. So we thought about how we could add some extra detail to both our mesh sprites as well as our paper 2D characters. And so we decided that normal maps would be a good way to do that. So uh, we've got a lot of unique sprites in our game. Over 800 in our largest level, and then around 200 per level on average and we do have a lot of levels in our game. So then how could we create normal maps for so many different assets? Do we generate them from height maps? Do we just create them all by hand? Uh, 
Uh, and so we decided to look into a few different approaches. Uh, the, first, the first approach we tried was getting, uh, generating normal maps from height maps. And so that's how 3D workflows normally work. So uh, this is something we decided to look into. But then if we do that, then how do we, de how do we create the height maps? Uh, well, for reference, this is what our sprites generally look like. Uh, this is just the base color texture. And you can see it's got uh, already occlusion, uh, specular highlights, and other lighting information uh, painted in. So we could use uh, programs like bitmap to material or other similar programs to, uh, to convert these color textures to height maps, as is sometimes done in 3D workflows. But because all that lighting info is already painted in, and because of the low resolution, when converting the result to normal map, it's hard to get any legible info out of it. So we could obviously spend a lot more time adjusting these textures, but then at that point, we might as well be hand painting them. So then what if we do hand paint them? Uh, it's still about the same workload for the artist, but the height maps can now be accurate to what the sprites represent. Uh, so then if we see here, if we convert this height map to a normal map, then the flat faces are a lot more readable, but then uh, the normal map is still breaks up when we've got these uh, in areas where the height map has too much detail. And so uh, we decided we couldn't actually get any uh, usable normal maps from uh, height maps. So then what if we paint them by hand, paint the normal maps by hand? Doing this is the most accurate we could get, but then the workload is even larger now for artists as they have to paint in more information. So we decided this approach also wasn't viable for us. Uh, in the end, we realized that because our sprites are so low resolution, we could essentially run an edge detection shader on them, and then we could uh, just generate norm edge normals from that. And so how that works is we've got an example here of uh, a selection of an alpha, of some theoretical alpha map we could have. And so the white squares are just opaque textiles, the black are transparent, and the red are outside the 0 to 1 EV range. Uh, so we'll just focus on the green texel in the center, and then we can also assume that texels outside the UV range are going to be transparent. And so we only need to focus on the eight surrounding texels of the texel we're focusing on. Uh, so here we check the top left texel, and that's outside the UV range, so we can assume it's transparent, and we had a unit vector in that direction, then the one below that as well, and then same goes for the one below that. And so then we check the one to the right of that, and it's inside the UV range. So then we sample the alpha map, and we find that it's opaque. So that means we don't need to do anything there. Then we check the texel to the right of that, and same, same story there. Then we check uh, the texel above that, and we sample the alpha map, and we find out it's transparent. So then we add in a unit vector in that direction. And then same story goes for uh, the one above that, and same for the last one. So if we add all these vectors up, we get something that looks like this. And you'll notice it's something, we get something that's over a unit long, but we don't actually care about that, uh, care about the length, we just care about the direction. And so all these vectors have been calculated in two dimensions. So uh, for the final normal, normal output, we have an artist control controlled intensity parameter. And so we normalize the 2D vector, and then we append 1 minus the edge normal intensity as the Z component, where intensity is just some float between 0 to 1. And then that guarantees that all normals will have the same uh, intensity when getting renormalized by the engine. But then that's not actually 1 minus the intensity. It's 1.001 minus the intensity, so that there's still uh, normal data for all non-edge texels, uh, so they can be normalized properly. Uh, so for reference, here's what our uh, sprites look like, again, without the edge normals. And here's what they look like with edge normals. You can see they add a, lo a lot of depth to the sprites in the scene, and they help ground them in the world. And now they lo look a lot more like physical objects instead of just flat cards that have been propped up. And so here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the fully textured scene. The normal maps help sell the uh, ominous mood of the scene that we're going here for a lot more. And this isn't really a perfect solution, as it doesn't cover all of our sprites perfectly. But it's enough to help sell the lighting and ground objects in the world. 
And so while it's subtle enough, uh, while it's subtle a lot of the time, it helps improve the look of the game quite noticeably. Uh, something we also noticed is in some cases it can look like a, a bad bevel shader in motion, which it essentially is, uh, but specifically on our game's protagonist, if you'll sort of look at uh, the edges of him as he moves around, the areas that aren't being shaded properly or that aren't being shaded fully, they look more like an outline shader, and that's not really what we're going for. Uh, so in those cases, we can lower the intensity of the edge normals and then combine them with uh, some handmade normal maps that the artist would make, and then we can adjust the intensities of those separately based on uh, what we need. Uh, at the moment, we're still experimenting with handmade normal maps since they do take a while to make, especially for these uh, multi-frame animations that our characters have. Uh, but here's an example of what the protagonist looks like, looks like with them applied at different intensities. On the left there, uh, there's no normals, in the middle, there's, uh, we have them at full intensity, and it looks cool, but it's a bit overdramatic. And so on the right, there is something that we would use in the final game. Uh, it's just something in between the two. Uh, and so wrapping up, what should you take away from this presentation? Uh, nothing is set in stone. You should experiment to see what works best with your visual style. And also, you don't have to use all the latest technology to make your game look good. Sometimes just doing what looks right is better than using these complex or physically accurate techniques. Uh, and so I just want to say thanks to the team, uh, specifically Alex, Toma, and uh, Christina for helping us uh, create this presentation. And then we've got some references there at the bottom, specifically the uh, inside one that really uh, influenced us a lot. And uh, yeah, that's all I've got. <laughs>